as we've been covering here, following Russell Brand's allegations of sexual assault, the comedian and commentator has been facing an onslaught of deplatforming and demonetization from various sites, including YouTube, the BBC, and Paramount+. Plus. Mm. YouTube said in a statement to The Hill, quote, we have suspended monetization on Russell Brand's channel for violating our creator responsibility policy. If a creator's off-platform behavior harms our users, employees, or ecosystem, we take action to protect the community. The company added, this decision applies to all channels that may be owned or operated by Russell Brand. The Gray Zone's Max Blumenthal responded to this move by recalling a time his own outlet faced their version of deplatforming and discussed this situation with Brand himself. Let's watch. Once again, the relationship between big tech and the government becomes quite curious. It's interesting and exciting when there's an obvious adversarial component, such as in our last story. But when you see this kind of cohesion, this kind of collaboration, like you cite with the Canadian trucker story, and obviously now you've been a personal, oh gosh, should we say victim of it? You've certainly experienced it. It makes you realize that Ultimately, what we're sliding towards are more and more normalized, centralized, authoritarian models, centralized currency, ability to close down. We're hearing more and more stories about the intervention in people's financial affairs. It's, what, it's something that's becoming more prevalent. And I'm not surprised that you're a prominent and high profile organization to be subject to that kind of obvious corruption. Max Blumenthal joins us now to discuss. Welcome, Max. Good to see you. And I believe that clip was from just before um, the accusations became public. You know, we've been discussing them a lot on the show. And obviously there's, you know, the context of the accusations themselves are, are, are one thing. But I think it's impossible and, and should be, you know, taken seriously. And we've been discussing them very seriously and, and, and you know, critic, somewhat critically of the underlying behavior, you know, despite it still being at the level of anonymous accusations. Um, but I, I, I am troubled still, you know, by by the fact it's stated in the story that this is all coming together now because of Russell, because of who Russell Brand is now, the audience he has now, and the uh, contrarian and adversarial relationship he has to the mainstream, and then also that even if you know you accept them as true, the accusations, which I'm, I'm not saying we're at the point where we should, but a a, a deplatforming of his content, of his speech, his words, his. Things he's created um, o over that seems very coordinated and very um, troubling and illiberal to me. We wanted to give you a chance to weigh in since you, know, you have experienced some of this as well as we just saw. Yeah, I mean, you took the words out of my mouth. Uh, I was on Russell Brand Brand's show on September 11th. It was one of his last shows before the Russell Brand affair. And we were discussing the gray zone being uh, suspended or having its fundraiser suspended due to external concerns by GoFundMe and the whole way that crowdfunding uh, companies were operating within the broader framework of the censorship industrial complex where the state goes behind the scenes into the offices of Silicon Valley companies and tells them who to ban, who to remove. And we've experienced that constantly. So n one, one thing is clear about the Russell brand affair, whatever the merits of the allegations are, and it's trial by media that he is being targeted because he has become perhaps the most prolific critic of corporate media and as well as, as well as the war state and the Ukraine proxy war on the planet. Maybe he may be second to Tucker Carlson, but he's clearly threatening some very powerful interests. And so he is being targeted in a coordinated fashion in the same way that he articulated somewhat ironically when he interviewed me. And it began through tabloid media in the UK. You could look at any newsstand in London the day the allegations hit. It was on the front page of every paper. The editors from The Guardian to The Sun to The Mirror, they were feeding off, feasting off this with libidinal satisfaction because they wanted to see him destroyed for what he had said about them. He had turned on Hollywood as well. So you saw all these prominent figures denouncing him. And he hadn't yet to receive due process. And as I expected, he was demonetized by YouTube, which is really the ultimate form of cancellation in our culture because YouTube, which is owned by Google, is essentially the inner vortex of our digital commons, which are privatized yet controlled from the outside by powerful interests, including the Department of Homeland Security, British intelligence, and so on. So this raises 
a larger issue. What terms did he violate? And YouTube says that he violated their rules for off-platform behavior, that you have to conduct yourself well off the platform. Well, if none of these allegations are confirmed and they haven't been, uh, they haven't been seen through in a court of law, then who is Google and a bunch of anonymous corporate functionaries to determine if someone is guilty of essentially felonies, they have possibly committed defamation. And, it, and at the same time, they're hosting the George W. Bush Library on their platform. They're hosting the Obama Foundation, which has 235,000 subscribers. Barack Obama and his administration raped Libya. That is a confirmed fact. They destabilized the most prosperous nation in Africa and caused a jihadist onslaught that is swept across the Sahel. George W. Bush raped Iraq, led, leading to the death of one million people, the rise of ISIS, the destabilization of that region. But they are welcome on YouTube's platform according to its guidelines governing off-platform behavior. So where are the standards here and who's setting him? It's the same institutions that are destroying large parts of the world that are setting these standards because the Obama Foundation, for example, is involved in determining what the disinformation and term policy in terms of service are on platforms like YouTube. So I take your point, Max, but I, I was talking about this uh, a little bit with a friend uh, yesterday, and they pointed out that there is a distinction between being allowed on the app, which Russell Brand is still allowed on the app, and being able to monetize uh, your work on the app, which could be potentially analogized to something like working for Uber or a company that you use their platform so that you can earn money and they provide you with income via the app. So is there a difference in your view between uh, being actually deplatformed and not being allowed to do speech of any kind, even if the content, the substance of your speech doesn't violate the terms of an app, and whether or not a company like uh, Google or Uber or some other kind of ride share delivery service decides that as a matter of policy, it doesn't want someone who's been accused of rape or assault or some other crime operating their vehicles, let's say. Well, YouTube wants to have it both ways. They want one of their most popular content creators to remain on the platform so he continues to draw an audience to its platform. They can't do to him what they did to Alex Jones, where he was completely removed. Uh, and at the same time, they're demonetizing him, which means necessarily, and any content creator on YouTube knows this, that his videos will receive much less traffic. So this is still an act of cancellation, and it feeds, it, it flows directly into the discussion I was having with Russell Brand about how dissenters and anti-establishment prominent anti-establishment voices are financially sanctioned inside the West for their political views, but they're never given due process. They're never given an explanation and they are never given the right to explain where they're right and where they're wrong. Now, the one time that we had to deal with a threat of a strike from YouTube and had something deleted without explanation, of course, was it was when we did a live stream at the Gray Zone about our report exposing a very famous British journalist named Paul Mason as a security state collaborator who is waging a campaign with security state intelligence operatives in the UK to attack the what he called the Corbynite left, the left of Jeremy Corbyn, another target of British tabloid media. No, I, and I, yeah, sorry, YouTube totally de deleted us and threatened us. So we have to question whether the state here is actually involved in the demonetization of Russell Brand. I think that's completely fair and that should be investigated, but I'm trying to drill down on a more generalizable point. I have objected to, for instance, the withholding of what feel more like utilities, you know, banking services, your ability to get on YouTube, to use yeah. the apps, to collect money through PayPal based on your underlying beliefs as very much an authoritarian move that I'm deeply concerned about. But what I'm asking here is if there's a difference in your view a substantive difference, even if you still think it's wrong, but a substantive difference between um, a almost an employee-employee relationship, uh, the way you get when you're using Uber as a driver or when you're monetizing uh, your content on YouTube and them saying, well, we're no longer going to allow you to use money on, make money on this app through us 
versus access to a banking system or access to a speech platform or access to using the telephone line in your house or an internet service or something that feels more like a broadly available utility that shouldn't be stripped from you on the basis of whether or not some uh, impartial public figure thinks that you're a good or a bad person. Is that a, is, isn't that a meaningful difference? Well, we both oppose civil asset forfeiture in which accused drug dealers have all of their assets seized by the federal government in a completely authoritarian fashion, uh, often without due process. And sometimes they're guilty of, of dealing drugs, but I would no, argue- No, I agree, that but is that the right have... analogy though, Max? Like, let's just take the- It's not the, the right, it's, well, here's the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the point. That's something that happens in the public realm and they supposedly get their day in court, but more and more people are, are forced to rely on an entirely privatized system, whether it's GoFundMe or YouTube, in order to earn a living because they are content creators. That's the way that people are going to deliver, their audience wants to deliver them support. And if they are removed and demonetized from there, they're essentially financially sanctioned. I work with someone who's been removed, our managing editor at the Gray Zone, Wyatt Reed, from PayPal and Venmo for no reason other than that he was reporting from the Russian separatist side of the Ukrainian conflict. Uh, I, I have several colleagues in the media who've been removed from PayPal, Venmo, they're getting kicked off TikTok. And slowly you can see as they get removed from these platforms, it's becoming harder and harder for them to earn a living. And that is precisely the point. And the state can't be held accountable the same way it can through civil asset forfeiture because it's doing it from behind the scenes. We don't know who made the decision to uh, buy YouTube or who, who prompted YouTube to make that decision. All we know is that it's incredibly coordinated and we also should consider the fact that the Times of London that led this story has targeted so many dissidents over the years and that the Times of London is a favorite publication for the MI5, MI6 to plant material. So what I'm saying, Brianna, is that the state now has the convenience of removing people from being able to earn a living or from public view canceling them and so on without putting its fingerprints on it. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what's happening with Russell I mean, Brand. We, we, I'm we using his case to make yet. a larger point. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely take that that could be the case and that should be investigated. But what we, I'm just trying to get yeah. to the bottom of what I we mean, do know right now. Go ahead. And, and, and it's, a, it's a little bit different. I mean, what disturbs me about this specifically with Russell Brand is that um, you know, on the you know on the social media platforms they have speech related policies you know we disagree with a lot of those policies this this show has you know been a victim of those mm -hmm. policies in ways I don't agree with but I like you know what the, when they deplatform Alex Jones you can maybe disagree with that but it's at least related to um, this potentially defamatory speech he's the content he's producing on the platform mm -hmm. what I find so disturbing here is Russell Brand is being punished for. Um, content that very, may very well be bad, I, I guess it could very well even be criminal, but does not have anything to do with the content or the speech being the, being right. posted on the platform, which gets into this whole, we have to go back and we have to like, you know, de destroy works of art or throw away DVDs of like that Harvey Weinstein happened to produce, even though there's tons of other creative people involved in it who are upstanding un until maybe they're not. And then we have to get rid of their things. That's the creepy part of this to me. Well, I mean, he's, he's not being demonetized for his content. His content supposedly adheres to YouTube's stated terms of service. I hadn't heard of this off-platform behavior. And YouTube has appointed itself the jury. It gets to be the jury because our digital commons are completely privatized. None of these charges have been adjudicated. He may be guilty. And here's another point worth considering. Let's say Russell Brand is totally guilty of everything. Let's say it's even worse than that. Let's say he's like Leatherface and he's throwing women on meat hooks in a hell hole in some rural county in Texas. Millions and millions of people will still not believe that that is true because the media and specifically the Times of London and the Murdoch media has lied them into so many disastrous situations. They lied about Jeremy Corbyn, the labor leader, being an anti-Semite day in and day out. They lied the public into the Iraq war. They lied about uh, Muammar Gaddafi giving his troops Viagra. They lied about Syrian chemical attacks to trigger Western intervention there. They lie day in and day out. Charlotte Waste, the lead reporter on the Russell Brand story, destroyed the life of a beautician in England falsely claiming she was destroying women's faces with rogue Botox treatments. Uh, it was they, when, when the Times of London was proven false, they still went to court and fought this poor woman's libel case anyway, tooth and nail. It destroyed her life. It destroyed her son's 
uh, mental fitness. And that's the Times of London. They went after so many dissidents that I know with front page stories in uh, over arcane themes that seem kind of irrelevant to the public, but which threatened the British intelligence services and British financial interests. And so the public will not believe anything about Russell Brand because of the way that the mainstream media has conducted itself. And that's what needs to be considered here. The well, mainstream media yeah. has indeed proven itself an enemy of the people. Max, let's play that thought experiment that you opened up there out a little bit. I completely take your point that the media has made itself untrustworthy, but there are aspects of these allegations that Russell Brand has admitted to in his books as part of his rehabilitation process. And so there's a separate conversation that I think needs to be had about what it means to be re rehabilitated, whether or not there's anything that someone like Russell Brand or anybody else who has admitted to being misogynistic and and be in the past and being embarrassed about their past behavior can do to really make amends to their victims and move forward. But taking your thought experiment, even if it is true, the media has discredited itself, that's fine. But if it is true, what do you think is a reasonable and responsible response from a uh, institution like Google or anyone else? And what should the response be from viewers, if, he, if people do find, even if it's not illegal, it to be distasteful for him to have had this relationship with a 16-year-old or the like, what, 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 what would be appropriate? Would it be appropriate for Google or, let's say, again, in the analogy, Uber to say, you can no longer drive my cars for me, you can no longer monetize yourself on my app because you engaged in a relationship with a 16-year-old? or you were coercive or did some of the things that she accused of them, like removing a condom in the, in the midst of a sexual intercourse without her consent, those kinds of things. Which Jul Julian Assange was accused of doing that, and he's been cleared of all rape charges, but it was the rape charges that were used to basically hole him up in the Ecuadorian I, embassy in I, London, I, make him I a de facto that. prisoner. So it's impossible to, we're responding to a it. situation we're responding to a situation or a, a scenario that's been manufactured by interests that are completely hostile to having any reasonable response. See, Max, my response and, would be and, that and even... So, so go ahead, go ahead. I, so I, I would say that YouTube even has if, created, a, <laughs> created a scenario... Yeah. Okay, well, you go ahead. I'm sorry, there's a bit of a delay, it seems. I was going to say that my response to the Julian Assange example would be, even if ever, all of the allegations were true, which I, they weren't, but even if all of the allegations were true, that means absolutely nothing about the value of his disclosures, right? That means absolutely nothing about the value of WikiLeaks. And I would similarly understand an argument like that about Russell Brand. The things that he's talking about, the truth to power, the content of his show is still valuable to people, regardless of whether or not these allegations are true. I think that's a, that's a fundamentally ethical position to take. But I do think that what some people are bristling about is a failure to acknowledge that, yes, it would be bad if some of this stuff is true and that it might be worth investigating, even if we shouldn't rush to judgment. Well, that that's an ethical question. It's not a question for YouTube because YouTube clearly is distorted on a gargantuan scale from an ethical point of view. As I pointed out, they are hosting people who have committed titanic crimes on their platform and allow them to monetize. So what they've done but, but is do highlight they, is, the contradictions and set up a scenario where pretty much anyone can be demonetized if they're accused of something. And we both know, even we, we personally know people in the alternative media world who've course. been falsely accused of these things. I mean, I could point to uh, a Jordan Chariton. I mean, I, he, he attacks me constantly to get attention, but I don't mind pointing out that he was falsely accused in a horrific way, but lost his job and really had his career his destroyed. He is able to monetize his channel. And Barack Obama, the examples that you were giving of all of these world well, leaders Well, right now, committed... Jordan Chariton, under these rules, would, ha would probably be demonetized just by being accused. And so it's important for us to demand due process and to call out the contradictions of this completely privatized, state-manipulated digital commons that does not serve us in any way. And that's why so many alternative platforms are being created, which creates and an, another ethical dilemma. Yeah, I, I was just trying to make the point that Barack Obama is not, I, I agree with everything you're saying about him and that obviously his crimes are worse than any individual crimes that Russell Brand or anybody else could be accused of, but that he does not have a YouTube page as I understand it and isn't monetizing anything. And so we don't really have that as a test case. So again, the thought experiment was- So we have Bill true, Clinton, the Clinton Global Initiative just hosted a parallel diplomatic uh, kind of pay for play meeting outside the UN just yesterday. 
But Max, that's Bill not Clinton Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton has been accused by multiple, multiple women and the Clinton Global Initiative and Clinton Foundation are able to monetize on YouTube. I mean, right, but, where are the standards Max, here? <laughs> Max, we're talking about whether or not a, 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 a content creator, someone with a website. I mean, the Obamas had a, had a documentary, right? On uh, They have a documentary. They had a podcast. They had they yeah, don't, it's, it's but, exactly They had a deal the with Netflix. Thing. They had a $100 million have, dollar deal right, with Netflix. But, but Netflix hasn't, you know, if we're talking about Netflix taking down Russell Brand versus Netflix taking down Obama, I think that's a fair comparison. But I'm asking well, about this YouTube. I'm specifically asking about this YouTube policy because it is difficult to ascertain. I'm, I'm legitimately trying to ascertain how much this is a deviation from their standard practice by finding analogous cases. And I'm- I, You I'm, don't have I'm, powerful people coming to YouTube or Google and telling them, you need to remove this person because they have been accused of serious crimes when it comes to Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush. But and again, so Max, it's obvious specific, to the public why, why Russell certain Brand people hasn't are being been targeted. Removed. Let's, let's be specific here. Russell Brand hasn't been removed. The issue is that he's been demonetized. Right. One of the major dividing lines in our political culture right now is whether you think Donald Trump is being targeted with a quasi weekly indictment because he threatened the quote unquote deep state or because he actually committed heinous crimes that no other president has ever been committed and that this is worse than Watergate. And and I would say that's what the election is going to be decided on. And so the Russell Brand case really fits into that dividing line in our political culture. Do you trust the system or not? And I would argue that most people do not trust the system, but the problem is in the US, they vote with their feet, which means they do not vote at all because they're so checked out of the system. So here's a case where powerful interests are obviously coming to YouTube to shut down someone who may have actually done horrible things, but they're doing it not because he did those horrible things. These are well known in Hollywood. He's written about it. Everyone knew about his antics. Russell Brand was never shy about it when he uh, attempted to rehabilitate himself. They're doing it because he threatened to, he's interfering with the objectives of this transatlantic establishment, which has destroyed countries across the world and, who's, and, and, who, and, and who the authors of that destruction are welcomed by those same institutions. David Frum is the toast of Democratic part, Party uh, elite in Washington, D.C. He's the guy who wrote the notorious lie into George W. Bush's speech that Iraq was involved in an axis of evil with weapons of mass destruction. Um, it, 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 Dick Cheney is still free to walk around in public. This is a guy who made billions of dollars off an Iraq war that he managed from day one while possibly even outing a CIA operative, Valerie Plame, which should have been a crime. I mean, everybody sees it in the public that the people who are accused and the, are, and, and the people who are demonetized and financially censored or politically censored are the ones that threaten the interests of the worst criminals and propagators of disinformation in our society mm. who happen to be in control of the social media platforms. Well, we gotta leave it there. Max Blumenthal, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot.